Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Eric Prince, co-founder of Marion West. I'm joined today by a Marion West contributing writer, Henry George, and Professor uh, Patrick Deneen. Uh, Patrick D J. Deneen is professor of political science and holds the David A. Potenziani Memorial Chair of Constitutional Studies at the University of Notre Dame. Prior to joining the faculty of Notre Dame, he taught at Princeton University and Georgetown U University. He received considerable acclaim for his 2018 book, Why Liberalism Failed, and joins us today to discuss primarily his new book, Regime Change for the Post-Liberal Future. So thank you for joining us, Professor. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Okay, so um, it's great to have you with us, Patrick. And I thought I, because you get asked this so often, I thought I'd just give a summary of what liberalism is and what its potential flaws are, and then we can go from there and get into the actual meat of the discussion. Great. So, um, in 1986, the British philosopher John Gray uh, condensed uh, liberalism's sort of fundamental tenets into a single paragraph, which I'll just go through, and then we can go from there. So he he wrote, "Common to all variants of the liberal tradition is a definite conception, distinctively modern in character, of man and society. Liberalism is individualist in that it asserts the moral primacy of the individual against the claims of any social collecti collectivity." egalitarian, in, in as much as it confers on all men the same moral status and denies the relevance to legal or political order differences in moral worth among human beings. Universalist, affirming the moral unity of the human species and according a secondary importance to, to specific historical associations and cultural forms. And mediarist, in its, in its affirmation of the corrigibility and improvability of all social institutions and political arrangements. It is this conception of man and society which gives liberalism a definite identity which transcends its vast internal variety and complexity. So I thought that was a pretty good summary of your previous book, Why Liberalism Failed, and the basis on from which you it is into yeah. regime change. So um it is, I, although I know yeah. it's interesting. It's uh um I think it's a more positive valence than even John Gray would give it yeah. today. <laughs> yeah, well, okay, exactly. I mean he, yeah, he's he's the Duma philosopher in chief. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um yeah. Yeah. so let's go let's go into your re most recent book, Regime Change, which I reviewed for the Critic magazine. I, I, yeah. I really enjoyed it. Appreciate so, that. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you. Um Leo Strauss defines a regime in what is political philosophy this way. Regime means that whole which we today are in the habit of viewing primarily in a fragmentized form. Regime means simultaneously the form of life of a society, its style of life, its moral taste, form of society, form of state, form of government, spirit of laws. So how would you, given us what his definition was, how would you define what a regime is in your view? Henry, I so much appreciate you uh, reading that passage from Leo Strauss. Uh, and uh, in response to many of the questions and, and reviews, and in many cases, critiques, uh, I wish that I had included that in the book, uh, mm. because that's precisely, that's precisely the sense in which I mean regime. Uh, and most reviewers who begin with the assumption that this is a, a book talking about change of government uh, at some level, I think I've missed, I, I really just completely missed the more comprehensive uh, yeah. way in which I'm using the word regime and in which I'm, I'm appealing to that. Uh, now, I, I, I did assume, perhaps mistakenly, that uh, it would be understood in the context of the book as a whole. But I do mm -hmm. think that uh, I do think that people define it and understand it much more narrowly to be concerned more or less exclusively with, with, with a change of government. And I think that's partly because of the way that it was used during the uh, lead up to the Iraq war in, yes. uh, in the eighties, uh, I'm sorry, first in the eighties and then in the, in the noughts. Uh, and, uh, but also I do think it, it reflects um, a narrowing of the aperture by which in the ways in which we think about broadly speaking, a constitution or broadly speaking, mm -hmm a political order that goes well beyond uh, the, the form of its government. So, yeah. so I, I'm actually just grateful to you for having read that. And, uh, uh, and I think, I think sense that that's really what this book is about. Absolutely. Um, so part of your book is um, you'll, it, a lot of it focuses on the conflict between what you call the many and the few. So could you um, perhaps define who are the many and who are the few, and then go into how, they're in conflict and what the causes of that conflict is. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's again another great question. That's difficult in some. It's difficult in some ways to answer with uh, a high degree of specificity. Partly because I think in general we can say that all political orders, every political order, social order that we can think of, has always had a ruling class. And it's always had those who are in some ways outside of the circle of the ruling class. Uh, and when this this phrase or this term, many and the few, is used in the classical tradition, it's really referring to that fact uh, that there's um, there's always a ruling order. It can be a wide circle. It can be a narrow circle. It can be the rule of one. It can be the rule of few. It can be the rule of many. Uh, 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 the, the, well, the rule of many few, as it were, uh, a large number of the few. Uh, but uh, its distinguishing mark is that um, is is that there's always a kind of in, inner circle and an outer circle of every regime. Now, the the basis on which the many and the few are distinguished is is alterable. It changes. Uh, there's uh, um, you know in, in an aristocratic society, it certainly had something to do with wealth and poverty, but that's not the only basis. In fact, it has a lot more to do with birth. Uh, and inherited status and rank uh, in a in a more maybe traditional society would also have that element of inheritance. It would also have um, distinguishing marks being those who are believed to be chosen by the gods or the prophets. Um, uh, and, and, and there are various ways of distinguishing. But for the purposes of this book, I think there's probably no better way of thinking about this than Aristotle's understanding, who describes um, a, a kind of a number of different regimes, he actually counts six in total. The rule of the one, the few and the many, uh, either which is um, oriented toward the common good in which, in other words, the interests of the one, the few and the many are not the basis of political rule, but concern for the political whole. And then the rule of the one, the few and the many in which the basis of rule is based solely on the interests of the particular ruling class. And then Aristotle goes on to say two, two things in particular that I'd like to highlight. The first of these is that most regimes that exist in the world that he sees, uh, and it's uh, many, many hundreds of centuries, uh, millennia ago, uh, but which I still think is largely true, which is that regimes either, either can be categorized as the rule of the many or the rule of the few uh, in their bad forms. So the first of these he calls the rule of the many who he recognizes are likely to be the rule of the poor. And the other main regime type is the rule of the few, uh, who it also turns out tend to be the wealthy. And this is still generally the case, I think, that most regimes we would categorize at some level as democracies or as oligarchies. And I think we're in the middle of a really interesting debate right now is what is, what is the United States and what is uh, what is uh, the UK or England or Britain right now? Is it uh, is it a democracy or is it an oligarchy? Uh, but but this basic point is that most regimes are divided along these lines, and then the big question in this tradition is how do we ameliorate this division, which tends to be a division that's at some level unbridgeable, in which each side is seeking the, if not the destruction, which is often the case, certainly the outright defeat uh, and ultimately uh, a form of despotism of one class over another class. Yeah, absolutely. And um, that leads nicely into my next question. So it seems from your book and, as you say, the traditional philosophy going back to the classical Greek period and all the way up to um, the Italian elite theorist that James Burnham talks about in the Machiavellians, that there's there's always an elite in a society that um, they're, they're, in a, they're in a inevitability. So the question, therefore, seems to be not whether there will be an elite, but you know, what kinds and how it's composed and what its beliefs are. Is that your view in, in some? Yes, that's yeah. quite correct. In other words, yeah. I, mean, I think it's, uh, it's clear in the, in the book itself, I think I say as much, uh, that there will always be an elite. So it's a kind of, I think it's one of the oper op operative fictions uh, in um, at least one aspect of contemporary or modern political philosophy. Uh, I think particularly in its Marxist strain, uh, that mm. somehow rule of the elites can can be overcome completely. Uh, you know, the idea with the dictatorship of the proletariat uh, and the elimination of the bourgeoisie is really a kind of fantasy of saying we can get rid of elites. Now, uh, 
one can say that Marxism has never been tried, but to the extent that it's been tried, um, uh, what we see is that clearly there's a reconstitution of a new elite. Like Marxism has really typically been the elimination of the older aristocracy and its, re its replacement uh, by a kind of new elite that claims the mantle of egalitarianism, uh, but which is in fact um, just kind of the old boss uh, is replaced by the new boss. Uh, so that, uh, uh, but then there's another, it seems to me another strand, and this is kind of high liberalism today, yes. uh, which is based on the notion that um, the only good form of rule is rule by, um, by an elite, and it's an elite informed especially by a kind of technocratic knowledge the rule of expertise and the rule of the knowledgeable, the rule of the well-educated. And I think that's the, uh, I think that's the background condition right now in which we have this growing, deepening animosity between a kind of working class, um, uh, you know, what, what would have once been called the proletariat at some level, um, but generally a kind of working class, um, less educated, less um, uh, managerial, uh, um, sort of element of the of modern society who are essentially being told by those who are in positions of power influence have hold institutional power uh, that they should be supine and more or less accepting of the rule of the more knowledgeable and i think there's been a real you know uprising against that in the economic world where we were all told that you know globalized borderless economic order would be beneficial for everyone we were told um that uh Obviously, in the context of COVID, uh, that the that we simply had to follow the science. Um, I think I think resistance to some of the uh, some of the claims being made by experts on what needs to be done about climate change, which mm. tends to redound uh, to the to the um, deleterious uh, impacts on again working class people. I mean, we see that um, you certainly see that in Britain uh, with yeah, the, yeah. Uh, the uh, the efforts to uh, pretty radically alter all systems, including, of course, the transportation yep. system without accounting yep. for you know the, the needs of the working class. So I, I, yes. I think in all of these domains, we're seeing in some ways the opposite claim to that of what, what was once the great claim in the earlier part of the 20th century, which was that we could eliminate this divide by making everyone equal. And now I think we're seeing its opposite, which is that we can eliminate this divide by simply just uh, all agreeing that will be ruled by a managerial expert technocratic class. Yeah, well, that, um, I, I totally agree. And so that, I, that again, leads nice into my next question. So um, from your book, it's obviously that um, in its current form, you don't view the current Anglo-American elite as worthy of their name or status. So do you do you think they've moved um, from, this, uh, Arnold Toynbee uh, talks about the creative minority and the extractive dominant minority. Do you think they've moved from a, creates a minority that generates um, the common good for, you know, the society as a whole, or do you think they are now a dominant extractive minority who basically um, uh, shape society for their own benefit to the mm -hmm. detriment of everyone else? Yeah. Yeah, no, it's a, that's a nice way to formulate. I think one of the, the under sort of the undercurrents of the book, uh, which is uh, I think we have, um, We've had a relative peace um, between, and I'm speaking now broadly of the, the last, basically since, since the end of the of World War II and during the Cold mm. War, War period, there was relative um, peace between these two classes to the point in which many in the West, many in the Anglo-American um, sphere had kind of thought we were past the, 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 past the period of class division. I mean, there was this kind of, this the sort of Daniel Bell's book, The End of Ideology, Sorry, there was this yeah, belief yeah. that uh, somehow the West had solved the problem that seemed to plague all societies, which was this division between the many and the few. Um, and I think this has you know, led to the current hubris and overconfidence of, of those who occupy the status of being elites in these societies, uh, of, the, of the kind of continued view that they are conferred with the status and position that should be largely unchallenged, that, that uh, those who are not in their circles should simply be grateful and benefit from the, from the wisdom and knowledge of that class. But I do think that, that um, and I'm not alone, of course, in, in, in recognizing this, that, that moment, those decades following World War II, certainly in the American sphere, um, maybe less so in the British sphere, although I think eventually it came to this point, 
we're, we're a, a kind of singular, unique, and probably not replicable moment in certainly in the history of the United States when, because of the largesse and the, the, the benefits of having been the kind of the, the, un, the untouched victor of World War II, you know, the, the, the country had been largely left, you know, uh, yeah. uh, without, without the destruction of, of Europe uh, and, um, you know, not suffering anything like the, 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 the again, the, the, both the death and the physical destruction of, uh, of, of the European countries, uh, that it was a kind of momentary and very exceptional uh, period uh, in which it could be believed in, by people of good faith that this division between the many and the few had been some, somehow had been resolved and bridged. And it was a time, and I think for good reason, many on both the right and the left today look back, at least in the United States, look back to the 1950s with a degree of nostalgia, uh, certainly on the left, because it was a period of time when the working class, when labor broadly, you know, it's kind of the, uh, especially the industrial manufacturing workers were doing very well, uh, certainly compared to how they how they had been treated in their condition in the early part of the 20th century, late 19th century. Um, and and in, the, in those decades after World War II, they were able to, without too much difficulty, extract a vast number of concessions that would have been very difficult before the war. It would have been very difficult to extract concessions like you know, considerable raises of wages, uh, significant benefits from companies. This is why we still have the problem with healthcare in the United States, because the healthcare provisions from the companies, from the corporations, were so good uh, that uh, there was never a need for a national healthcare system. Uh, yeah. Most most workers were covered by very good plans provided by their employers. And the same was true of pensions. Pensions were provided through corporations. So this was all done as a kind of remarkable, again, a kind of bonus um, uh, after the uh, after World War II, in which it was not a painful kind of extraction. There was so much to go around. So I think you're, behind your question is, you know, with the waning of those conditions, the pie is shrinking. And now suddenly you have people who occupy positions that they've, they've inherited or that they, they now occupy under the same now self-deceived belief that they are living in a post-class society uh, and who continue to believe that they are essentially acting uh, with the best interest of the working class in mind, but whose positions increasingly, it seems clear, it just seems just evident the more you watch uh, and, and observe the behavior of today's elites, that it is a very self-serving set of positions uh, that are really benefiting from a, a, you know increasingly shrinking global pie and certainly a shrinking pie uh, in the United States. Absolutely, and um, part of that, um, you know, part of that entrenching this uh, elite's power is the uh, role of meritocracy, which you talk about both yeah, in why the right. failed and again in low regime change. So. Um, what, in your view, do, what role does meritocracy play in entrenching the new elite's power and um, also undermining the ability for the many to pursue decent lives lived in common with each other? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually really glad you asked about this as well, Henry. Um, it, it's interesting right now how much the idea of meritocracy and the, uh, uh, um, the idea of meritocracy is really being um, revived as a topic of debate. And you have yeah. today particularly on the left, a kind of wholesale attack in the effort to dismantle the meritocratic system in the name of a kind of what's now called equity, in the name of um, not, not, not merely equality, but in, the, but in the name and with the ambition of elevating those who have not benefited from the current system. And so in some ways you could say it's a replication of a certain Marxist agenda of replacing the old elites with with a new set of elites, the downtrodden. So it's based less on the idea of merit, but it is, uh, it, it is a claim that uh, in order to have justice after the system that's benefited some number of people, whether you know, for, because they went to certain schools, they've had certain jobs because of the color of their skin, because of historical legacies and so forth, that there needs to be essentially a replacement of, of the downtrodden with those who have been the beneficiaries. So that's the, the kind of current critique of meritocracy. Now, on the side of the of, of the right, increasingly, you have this robust 
and very strenuous and vocal defense of meritocracy, mm -hmm. uh, which again, it's, it's interesting that this is becoming increasingly a partisan issue because certainly when I was growing up, it was a bipartisan agreement that meritocracy was the meritocracy with a degree of, you know, some degree of affirmative action was the proper uh, and acceptable system by which those who would be in the leadership class were selected. And so right now we're in the middle of this really uh, trenchant debate on whether or not this idea of a meritocracy should continue. And I find myself um, in neither camp. I, yeah. I'm sort of a pox on both your houses kind of person right. because yeah. um, as I as I talk about a bit in the book and, and, and I've written about elsewhere and I think you know books by Michael uh, Sandel yeah. And Daniel Markovitz have, have really demonstrated meritocracy is really at this point is a pretty self-serving, largely inherited, it sets up an, a set of inherited positions. And then beyond that, it, um, it develops a kind of mindset in which those who have attained their positions through the assumption of a meritocratic system become very self-congratulatory, become very condescending and uh, um, dismissive of those who have not succeeded. Uh, in other words, it, it's, it's their fault for not having uh, been successful under the meritocratic system. So the meritocracy, it, it seems to me, is a really deeply flawed system. But then so is what's being proposed, this idea of equity, where we're getting diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives that are beginning to take over the universities and corporations and so forth. So what is my alternative? Well, my alternative, um, it probably won't surprise many of your listeners. My alternative really draws on what I see as the, um, the an older tradition, uh, which preserves the idea that there are those who are endowed with certain gifts and talents. And it's a mystery why this is. I, you know, God and his providence and his wisdom yeah. that lies beyond my know, by my knowing, uh, endows certain people with, with certain abilities and certain gifts. And for some people, it's the ability to be leaders, and some people, it's the ability to be thinkers and intellectuals, and some to be doctors and so forth. Uh, and some people are not necessarily endowed with these gifts. Uh, but that God, or let's say the, the, the universe, I would say God, uh, does this not so that those who are especially bestowed with gifts of leadership, gifts uh, in which they will become the, the leaders of, of their various institutions or the society itself, not that they become self-congratulatory, but they understand this as a kind of gift that is something that they are obligated uh, to exercise for the benefit of everyone in their society, for those who are the least well off. So they, they act as a kind of steward or as a kind of trustee of these talents and gifts and not as the possessors of these gifts. And this is why I think liberalism teaches us that whatever we are, whatever we have, whatever we, we possess is us. That, that's our property, right? Locke, Locke argues in yeah. the book five of the second yeah. treatise, right? You, you own yourself. Yes. And I think like from this idea of self-ownership, one, one adopts the view that whatever my, my talents are, whatever my abilities are, well, these are, these are mine. And whatever I, whatever, however, in whatever way I benefit from these gifts, well, those are mine. And it's the consequence of my ownership and my self-development. So I propose here, you know, when we talked earlier about regime change, well, this is one way in which, how did you put it? Or how did Leo Strauss put it? Um, the... A regime is the whole form of life of a society, its style, its moral atmosphere, it's yeah. a spirit of its laws. Well, this is this is one way in which a very different under, understanding of what our talents and gifts are would constitute a regime change. That, that's not a change of government. That's not a change of you know, who's the president or who's in the bureaucracy. That's a change of worldview. And that's, that's one key element of a regime change is to is to reject both this meritocratic idea of self-ownership and self-possession, but also this, I think, kind of neo-Marxist idea of, uh, of of equity as the as the proper way to arrange uh, positions, offices, and so forth. Yeah, absolutely. And um, you, the replacement uh, regime that you propose is what you call the mixed constitution, which um, you root in classical philosophy, and also you took you include uh, to Tocqueville as well in this discussion. Um, so could you just briefly lay out what your um, analysis of the mixed constitution is, and then we can perhaps go into its realism for using it in America yeah. and also maybe the UK? Yeah, thank you. In fact, I think this element of the book, which is a key element of the book, um, 
I think it probably has more resonance in the UK than it does in the US. I think I think the tradition yeah, I, of the I, mixed constitution yeah, is. I, I have to say, I have to say that I thought it's, it's going to sound weird, but I thought your book was actually better aimed at the UK than the US. Somehow. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I think well, I certainly think the reception has been warmer because I mean, in part, I'm using a number of British authors. You mentioned De Tocqueville, but of course, Disraeli also yeah, yeah. plays a plays a key role in in this discussion. But the I think in part. And this goes back to something I said earlier. It's not just as a result of World War II and the post-World War II period that America thought it was a classless society. This, I would say, myth is actually is, is deeper and longer. Uh, that that um, there's been a belief that even if there are effectively classes, that there's not class in the sense in which Britain has come to understand that or has historically understood yeah, because yeah. It, because there is no aristocratic tradition as such in the United States. And so the idea of a mixed constitution sounds strange to our ears because it does at, at, a, at, at a certain level, it, it does have in its background the pre-existence of an aristocratic and a uh, sort of aristocratic order or an order in which there's a division of society along fairly well-defined class lines. And that really has not been as much a part of the American tradition. And yet that said, as I, as I said, if it's been sort of notionally or theoretically not true, it's of course been practically true that we've had classes yeah. in our society. There's been more fluidity between the classes, uh, moving between the classes, less well-defined, but we have had, uh, and we continue to have these kinds of divisions uh, and for the reasons we just were discussing, they, they've become, I think, worse uh, in recent years. The classical tradition, until fairly recent times, and we mentioned Israeli so well into the 19th century, or Tocqueville into the 19th century, argued consistently that the way in which one would productively and peacefully uh, reconcile or bring to a kind of peaceful resolution what can otherwise be a, a, a an incredibly destructive division in politics, the division between the many and the few that we've been discussing, that the, that the ideal way and the best way to resolve this, at least in many cases uh, that, in which it's possible, is through the form of the mixed constitution. So here again, I think when I use the word constitution, we can almost use the word regime interchangeably. And I think I yeah. do, in fact, do this in the book. I talk about mixed regime and mixed constitution. And I I mean constitution here in that broadest sense that we uh, that you began uh, by invoking Strauss to describe. So when, again, when most Americans hear this word constitution, we think the written document that lays out the offices mm -hmm. of the of the federal government and relationship of the federal government and the state governments. But when I'm using the word constitution, I really mean this to describe an, a whole way of life, uh, mm -hmm. and it's the style, the moral, the kind of spirit of the laws. A mixed constitution, I'm sorry, yeah, the, no, a mixed constitution think, is yeah. one, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to yeah, say, um, you, you're, what you're saying reminds me of um, Russell Kirk's unwritten constitution that he talks about in many of his books. And um, yes. he recently gave a speech to ISI about his uh, Return of American Order uh, book, which That's right. he uh, put the essays up online, which I, I really enjoyed. And um, yeah, I think, you. you know, his, his thinking about the unwritten constitution is quite, I think, quite alien to american culture at large anyway and it's also quite alien to the american right now which you know when you say constitution as you just said you know they think of the written document they don't, they don't think about mm -hmm. the way of life as such so yeah that's I just, right i just want to add that in so yeah please, please continue. yeah no it's worth it's really worth underlining because i i do think that those that that phrase has a different um kind of resonance uh, in the british context and, and in some senses i'm trying to challenge my american fellow americans to to take a wider view of what it is uh, the way in which we should understand a constitution. Yeah. And so by mixed constitution here, I'm uh, here following again, thinkers going all the way back to Aristotle, but also Polybius, uh, Machiavelli, uh, um, Tocqueville, uh, Disraeli, I, I name a number of figures in the book, uh, is the idea that, uh, that only through a kind of mixing of the classes, uh, only by um, not just mixing, of the offices, which is, um, so for example, Aristotle points to the example of the jury trial as a way in which ordinary people can exercise the powers of government that has a, 
really quite extraordinary impact. Right? We're deciding, you know, what whether someone has committed a crime, whether they should be incarcerated or potentially executed. Uh, and we're relying on not on expertise or any special set of talents, but we're saying that because they are citizens, they are endowed with the kind of common sense powers to determine, you know, certain certain kinds of outcomes. Uh, so that the idea of mixed constitution was to mix the classes in society, both in the in the features of its government, but also the broader elements of society, uh, to 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 have a greater degree of interaction, a greater degree of knowledge of each other. Now, in the context today, I think it's extraordinarily important, in particular for what we've been describing as today's elites, a kind of managerial, typically highly educated, typically brought up in a very kind of fairly elite or let's say homogenous bubble of similar people, of like-minded people, often geographically segregated from others outside of their class, um, except for maybe workers who come to their properties and so forth, yeah. uh, that that we need to, we, we actually need far greater mixing, especially of today's elites with those who, as we were saying earlier, those to whom, in particular because of the assumptions that accompany meritocracy, toward which they have a kind of inherent, or let's say a, a kind of implicit condescension or dismissiveness. Uh, and I think the, you know, one of the, one of the, I'm not the sole reason, but a significant reason for the divisions that we're seeing today is this, not just geographic separation, but a separation of worldviews, uh, a kind of lack of knowledge and understanding of those who are occupying very different spaces and very different lives in under a system that is largely benefiting today's elites and significantly hampering the prospects for flourishing of those who are not in the elite circles. And so it's especially this element of mixing that I'm speaking of, but it's also reaching back to this, uh, this really kind of very classical, but also I think British understanding of mixed uh, constitution uh, that uh, uh, could, could use some uh, reviving or even uh, 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 introduction within the, within the American context. Yeah. And so um, there's the, now, unfortunately, infamous phrase in your book, um, Machiavellian means towards Aristotelian ends. And I should just say for people listening, that doesn't mean that Professor Zanin wants to overthrow the government through violent <laughs> means, which is what he's been accused of by some people, which is, uh, that's yeah, that's, I know, it's, they're not, not serious people who say that. Um, yeah. I was, because your, your take on the Mexican constitution makes me, reminds me of the fact that you were in Britain in 2019 when the, um, the Tories won their base majority right. based worked, yes. on a campaign which is aiming at many of the things you're talking about you know the leveling right. up so the so-called agenda of mm -hmm. boris johnson um trying to get the um geographical divide in britain between the rich and the poor with town the towns and the cities the north and the south to try and ameliorate that um because it's grown quite large to mm -hmm. say the least um i think um the tragedy, of course, is, is that that hasn't happened. And, right, yeah, um, no, right. the, the majority The majority has been wasted, and we're now looking at a Labour government who probably, I would say, exemplifies everything that you've been talking about of the way that our elites are not worthy of the name today, because they're mm -hmm. technocratic, and it's an overused word, but neoliberal, I suppose, would be a good word for them. Yes, um, I, right. And yeah. I'm not... Oh, Maybe you know who knows what will happen in the next year or so between the now and the election, but I'm not hopeful that the um, Tories will be able to turn it around in time. So we'll we'll see. Um, yeah, but yeah, yeah, I mean, how just out of interest, how was it for you being there when they won that? Like, because for us in in the UK on the right, it was a pretty amazing experience because yeah. uh, you know we we were faced by a, I think it would be safe to say a, a literal Marxist in Jerry Corbyn. Yeah, um, and so it was a, it was a bit it was a it was a surreal night in how big the majority was and yeah. all that stuff yeah how was it for you as a visitor from abroad yeah no so i was very fortunate very blessed uh to be teaching at notre dame's program yeah for the students studying in london um in the fall of 2019 and so not only was i present for these remarkable i mean just really a whole series of remarkable political uh mm. events including including the official 
passage of Brexit, the prorogation of Parliament, yeah, uh, yeah, obviously yeah. the election. I mean, yeah. it was really a fascinating yeah. time as as a student of politics to be to be. It wasn't so fun to live in it. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, again, I was I was living yeah. sort of, uh, as an observer. No, absolutely. Uh, but of course, you know, in retrospect, it was also the you know five months before the world was shut down with COVID. Boy. So I feel especially fortunate that I got to experience uh, pre-COVID life in London for six months. Uh, it, that I, did, I, I remember very vividly, as I'm sure many do, the night of the election and when the returns began coming in, yes. and it felt it felt a bit um, a bit like the earthquake of when uh, Donald Trump won yes. the election. Uh, it was less, you know, was, I think it was less surprising than Donald Trump yeah, winning yeah. the election. Yeah. But what was really the earthquake element of it was how by the, the margins by which Boris Johnson and the Tories won the you know the the, the former labor yes. working class districts the red uh, wall, the wall. So. Yeah. yeah sorry sorry you 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 say red wall the red wall yeah yeah uh, yeah the red wall districts <laughs> yeah uh, they colors. say blue wall here but, <laughs> yeah yeah, uh, uh-huh. yeah red walls can work it's correct um yeah, yeah how, how you know the the margins were just extraordinary it wasn't yeah. they weren't victories that were in most cases weren't just sort of squeaking by yeah, yeah, yeah. uh by a by you know less than a percent they were significant yeah. margins and it really did reflect uh something that I'm, I, I think i try to explore in the book which is the divide between the many and the few is not just a division between those who sort of are the haves and those who are the have-nots yeah and I think that's a very, that's again, a very Marxist and narrow way of looking at it. The case I attempt to make in the book is that the division between the many and the few also has a kind of, broadly speaking, a kind of, I don't want to say ideological, but it, it, it encompasses a, uh, or it implies certain tendencies to certain worldviews. Yeah, ways the, of life. The ways of life. Uh, the, the, the few tend, because they are, partly because they tend to be more wealthy, but not only because of that. And especially today's elite have certain features or qualities to them that have led in more, what I would almost describe as kind of more Gnostic directions, uh, kind of um, being less bound to the stuff of the world. And I think this was reflected in, you know, what today we call the woke ideology, the, um, the idea that their borders and boundaries are meaningless, that nationalities are irrelevant, that history is something that can be discarded, statues it's, can be yeah. torn down. Physical reality. Physical reality, that yeah. um, uh, that uh, a man and a woman is an interchangeable or, or alterable yes. uh, yeah. condition. So all, all of these are part of, you could say, a, a condition of of being in in the elite today that is not entirely indistinct from being an elite in previous ages which is that you don't suffer the consequences of the world as directly uh yeah. when when things go wrong you are less in touch with the sort of stuff of reality and for this reason the many it may be that they're less well off and maybe that they're reasonably well off as they probably are today but they're far more likely to be in touch with the stuff of reality, uh, simply because they, you know, when things don't quite go as well as they could go, they're more directly impacted by those things. Uh, yeah. And so there is, broadly speaking, I think a way in which the many tend toward a kind of instinctive or intuitive conservatism, right? a kind of, you know, wanting the, the traditions uh, to continue, wanting a way of life to continue, not wanting things to be upended in the name of progress when what progress will typically mean is we're going to do something that's unknown. We don't know what the what the situation or the conditions will be like when we upend or uproot these old conditions. So it's very, it's a kind of intuitive Burkeanism, if you could put it that way. It's yeah. that this is a kind of a way of life that we have inherited. It's what we know and we know that it works. Uh, and until there's some reason to think that it has to be changed, we're not going to throw it off with kind of a, a you know, sort of an indifference or, or, or haphazardness. And it's, I think this was what was especially demonstrated in the election of 2019 was it was, uh, it was an, uh, former labor voters who had voted for labor previously right. because labor had defended their way of life. Labor had represented them as yeah. laborers. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it had defended yeah. their their the kind of work they did, 
the, the expectation that the work they did would be fairly rewarded and that they could, with reasonable expectation, pass on their condition to their children. But labor, as we know, had ceased to, to represent them. They had ceased to be people who guaranteed or sought to uh, protect the condition of those of that working class, of the many in this case. Now, the Tories, and I think for the in, here in the United States, the Republicans have attracted these voters because they now stand almost by default as the party that says we are with the common people. We are with the ordinary people. We don't buy the whole woke agenda. But I think like the Tories, the Republicans today are actually not really doing anything to defend uh, and support the condition of the working class. They're actually using the electoral support to more or less protect you know, the kind of, you know, the, the constituents of, that they have been representing for the last, you know, since, again, since yeah. at least the 1980s. So, again, a very similar condition, but at least on that night in 2019, yeah. I thought maybe things really are about to change. Well, I was just going to lead into the fact that you were talking about a lived Burkeanism, which um, you've called common good conservatism. Um, so, you know, I agree with this common good conservatism because it's the cause of, of um, my worldview and how I live as a, you know, because, you know, using that horrible phrase, speaking as a disabled person, it makes sense. So, but, and you also reference British conservatives like Evan Burke and Benjamin Disraeli as ex examples of this to draw on. Um, so, but the American conservative movement is not this. So how would you say that your vision of common good conservatism differs from the mainstream American conservative movement that's been in existence roughly since the 1950s when Buckley, yeah. etc. Got it started. Yeah, um, this I feel like this is a again a, a question that uh, both it seems obvious at one level and probably needs days to answer on another level. Uh, so we have a we have a conservatism so called in the United States and I think in Britain today that is really a species of liberalism. It's a, liberalism, it's a, yeah. a form of it's a form of what we you know I think now increasingly call and even they themselves now increasingly refer to themselves as liberals or right liberals. Yeah. Uh, by right liberals, what this really means is that it's a form of classical liberalism. So it's liberalism that preceded progressive liberalism. It's the classical liberal tradition that you would associate with thinkers like Locke, with America's founding fathers, to some extent with John Stuart Mill, although I think he's a transitional figure. Uh, and so that right liberalism is the liberalism that's especially, well, to go back to John Gray's definition, it's individualistic. Uh, it uh, um, stresses you know, the egalitarianism of rights. The numbers of rights that we bear are smaller or more constrained than progressivism, life, liberty, and property. Uh, it's universalist in the sense that there's only one measure by which you can uh, determine whether a regime is a political order is... Um, uh, is legitimate, and that's through the consent of the governed, so that any sense of tradition or history becomes irrelevant in that calculation and evaluation. Uh, so today's conservatives are, uh, or so-called conservatives, would be the kind of heirs of, of the Reagan-Thatcher uh, moment, uh, and continue to hold the view that this is the, the true and best form in which to confront and both confront progressivism and to answer the question, the answer the challenges that we face today. Now, this conservatism, of course, has contributed quite significantly to the challenges we face today. It, it, you know, it was definitely it was deeply involved and invested in the globalization project. And this was a kind of joint neoliberal left-right. You know, Tony Blair, Bill Clinton, George W. George H. W. George W. Bush. This was a project of several generations on both the right and the left uh, of liberals who both agreed whatever their differences agreed that the kind of globalist project, the movement, uh, the, the de-industrialization of the nations, the financialization of the economies that we've seen, the, the effective elimination of borders uh, in, in, in both of our respective countries, uh, the idea that a market as well as a country really had to be bounded, unbounded, boundaryless, uh, and therefore both both labor and uh, products need to move you know effortless, 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 effortlessly across what were once boundaries and borders this was, these were all part of a project of what what's called conservatism today and i think i'm not the first to recognize and to ask the question what is being conserved 
by this by this agenda. And all, all the while that these, you could say these, um, uh, the way in which a way of life is organized around the idea of a nation, a community, an economy that's defined by the national interest or bounded by the national interest in which work is a positive good and it needs protection. Uh, the, the life of workers is, um, and the pr productivity of workers trumps the concerns of consumers, right? which is, I think, a, a major, also a change that's happened. That the sort of de deconstruction of all of the institutions and we could say the way of life uh, that, that informed that worldview was what was taking place while these conservatives were claiming they were also in favor of family values and traditional values. Well, this is just an absolutely absurd claim on its face. And I think it's, it's absurdity has become evident to people who have, again, felt the direct impact of this disassembling of, of a way of life and are finding that the prospects for having family and traditional values and a way of life have become you know, almost impossible uh, under the, the kind of current conditions. So the, the call for a common good conservatism on the one hand is a kind of, it's a reaching back to a tradition. So in this sense, it's conservative. Some would say it's reactionary because it's trying to reach back, but it's really trying to reach back to a kind of pre-liberal understanding of what a conservative world looks like. It includes that idea of the mixed constitution. It includes the idea of common good, which is informed not only by the word common when it means that which is shared, that's one way of certainly of understanding and right, rightly of understanding common, but also is informed by the, the other meaning of the word common, which is ordinary. It's, uh, it's that which is shared, which is also ordinary. What makes life, what makes the prospects for life, uh, for a good life possible, even if one is, even if one is among the commoners, even if it's one is a life. common person, right? Uh, and. That's a question that it seems to me that is not especially being asked uh, by the so-called conservatives today. And this is why I think you and I were both excited about the election of 2019. And in my own way, I was excited about the election of Donald Trump, not because I was a big fan of Donald Trump, but because it was to me an indication that the demands of the working class to have a ruling class that was attentive to their common good to the common good that's shared and that's ordinary was having a political impact and might have some force going forward. And I think what we have seen is that the, both the neoliberal and progressive liberal juggernaut has been pretty effective uh, in reasserting its status, primarily because it controls not the electorate, but it controls the institutions. It, it controls the wealth of our society. So there's a real question now, uh, and I think it's, it's coming up in your election, it's going to be coming up in our election, of whether or not the reassertion of like the empire strikes back, as it were, whether the imperial uh, stormtroopers, as it were, in the form of uh, AEI and the Heritage yeah, Foundation are, yeah. are, able to, uh, are able to reassert um, their control of the agenda of the, cons of the so-called conservative movement. Um, yeah. So I, I, am I, you know, this book was written in the hopes it would be a kind of intellectual explication of what had happened really from the bottom up. It yeah. was not, it was not the result of, you know, you mentioned William F. Buckley earlier, right? That the, yeah, yeah. that the earlier generation of conservatism was the kind of creation of a set of elites yeah. who almost in a laboratory devised the idea of fusionism and yeah, said, this, fusionism, is how yeah. this is how we're going to organize a political movement. And it really was an elite level project. The rejection of fusionism was genuinely, I think, a very bottom up uh, uh, eruption. And bottom up eruptions, uh, populist eruptions can be very powerful, but they tend not to have staying power over a long period of time, unless you have a kind of a set of elites who come in and begin to articulate, yes. right? Yeah. yeah, begin to right. Hopefully, That's move really some uh, influence, some political figures, some yeah. uh, some media. You know, again, the the institutions that any political movement needs to become a sustainable political movement, yeah. and that that part that part of this uh, this project is is challenging. But mm. this 
book was written in the hopes that it could be at least a contribution in that direction. Absolutely, and I think um, I'm I'm hoping it will be. And um, just to just to sort of put um, just to supplement what you just said about the um, nature of the supposedly conservative movements of the last sort of fifty years or so. Um, there's a, there's a story that Margaret Thatcher once walked into her cabinet meeting and slammed a copy of Hayek's Constitutional Liberty down on the cabinet table and said, "This is what we believe," which kind of says it all about you know her right. ideological priors. And then she also apparently said, um that Tony Blair was her greatest achievement after she left office. So there you go. Yeah. Um, so so it, it, yeah. just as a, incidentally, I'm actually uh, next week, I'll be teaching Hayek's Constitution of Liberty. Oh, okay. and, yeah. and I always end uh, the session with, this, it's a class on liberalism and conservatism in which I include Hayek as one of the liberals. I mean, yeah. In any way, well, shape, essay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the last essay is called yeah. Why I'm Not a Conservative. Um, yeah. uh, and that really, that essay, Really does sum up why you know a libertarian, a pure libertarian position, it ought not and yeah, cannot exactly. be mistaken with with a, with a conservatism. And Hayek yeah. expresses this. And so for Margaret Margaret Thatcher to say this is our Bible or this is our this is our guide, uh, it really it really was maybe inadvertently. I don't know if she read got to that chapter, but <laughs> yeah. inadvertently a, an admission that the so called conservative conservative movement of the of the 1980s was really anything but conservative yeah in, in the fundamental sense of the word so um we'll go to the last two questions now so i don't, I don't want to take too much more of your time um sure. so both both because you, you've met we've talked about burke and disraeli already so both burke and disraeli they wrote in praise of national life as a sort of beneficial form of loyalty and a source of solidarity so in your view um what role does the nation play in this vision in your vision um mm -hmm. Is it, a, is it a sphere of loyalty that enables what uh, Roger Scruton called the first person plural, giving us a sense of the, the we, uh, mm -hmm. of an us? Or is it um, is it a barrier to and a solvent on more rooted local loyalties to the near and the dear? Yeah. In some ways, it can it can be both. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, in, in other words, um, and I, in the book, actually, in the concluding chapter, which in fact, I think is from my from my view is the most important chapter. It's probably the one that gets the least attention, but uh, uh, it's the one in which I do talk about regime, maybe in this broadest sense. And one of the th the things I talk about is that topic, much in the air of, of nationalism and nation, yeah. in which I give a kind of qualified endorsement of nationalism. And the and the first thing I note in that is that nationalism was originally a, a progressive liberal. Um, or I would say was originally a kind of liberal, um, uh, it was closely tied to the liberal movement uh, in its earliest in its earliest form, you know, the kind of Hobbesian Lockean idea of the nation, in particular, the nation would be the space in which any disputes over church and church doctrines would be resolved by the sovereign. This is certainly Hobbes's view. This is why in the famous picture, he holds the sword and the crozier, right? Uh, so that the, the the nation would be the, in some ways, the enclosure of the religious and theological differences of, of the of the Reformation, post Reformation period, but um, the real energy and juice of modern nationalism is especially a progressive project. Uh, it begins with figures in the United States like Woodrow Wilson and the Theodore Roosevelt, who wrote a book called The New Nationalism, uh, and um, Herbert Crowley, a significant American figure who founded the New Republic. You know, there, there's an interesting title of a journal for you, the New the New Republic. Uh, and what the one of the main reasons behind this uh, progressive embrace of this idea of nation was in order to undermine more local forms of loyalty and self understanding. So of course it had in its aim. This is in the post war uh, post uh, Civil War period trying to weaken people's sense of identification with in the United States, the, the, their states, or in England, it would be their districts or their, their regions to weaken what was seen as parochialism or partiality, local loyalties that were seen as um, too partial and uh, not encompassing enough that the nation should be the locus of our deepest political loyalties. And for this reason, I think we can see why and how the move from being national 
nationalists among progressives eventually, in some ways, must inevitably becomes anti-national. It becomes opposed to the nation because eventually the nation is going to be itself too local and too parochial. It's going to be seen as this limited, this limited identification. And so that progressivism moved from an endorsement of the nation to an endorsement of the globe or cosmopolitanism. So that to be a cosmopolitan was our proper and true identification. But it's not, to, it's not in contradiction of their one-time loyalty or call for loyalty to the nation. It's actually a kind of further development of, of that basic insight. And this is where um, in, that, in that last chapter, I talk about the nation. We rightly have, uh, I seem to me, an identification and loyalty or should have a identification and loyalty with our nations. They are places that you know, provide us the umbrella of defense and uh, safety. Uh, they are places of traditions, uh, of history, uh, and I'm grateful as a uh, now, I guess, a third or fourth generation Irish American for uh, the, the, you know, the opportunities this country gave to me when I might have been a potato farmer had my family not immigrated to the United States instead of a college professor. But um, but the nation and identification of the nation should not be uh, embraced at the cost of or at the detriment to more local loyalties. Uh, and this is, uh, and at the same time, it should also not be uh, purchased or, or embraced at the penalty or at the cost of loyalties or identifications that can go beyond the nation. And this is where I think we need to think of ourselves in much more of a continuum, that the nation is absolutely and vitally important. And it is, we do owe to it a kind of deep allegiance but there are loyalties that we hold beyond the nation, and that might be, of course, religious obligations that we hold. The nation can't, uh, no nation can or ought to contradict our religious loyalties. Uh, and, uh, and nor should a nation seek to cancel out or replace more local loyalties. And here, I think I would agree with, maybe to some extent with Roger Scruton, who talks about oikisms and about oh, yeah. uh, identification. Oikophobia. Right, oikophobia, oikophobia, oikophilia. Oikophilia, yes, yes. Oikophilia, yes. The, yes. Oikophobia is progressive. Against it, yes. Yeah, it's is, forward, the, yeah. is the is the love of one's place, and and I think Roger Scruton more than anyone yeah. held identifications with very local places. I mean, I yes. love his books uh, about his life as a farmer. Yeah, like, um, on settling. Life. Yeah. Yes, I, just yes. read it. I just read it yesterday. It's, it's wonderful. Yeah, it's just a wonderful. And that book, yeah. news, news from somewhere. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's the book. one. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful book. Yeah, and I, but I think that it's that, you know, that Roger Scruton would be the first to say, I am a loyal and deeply devoted uh, subject and citizen of England and Great Britain. But I am also deeply loyal to these particular places. And, yeah. I, and, I, and I think too often in our politics, where there's a demand laid at our feet to say, declare one loyalty. Are you a cosmopolitan against the nation? Or are you, are you a nationalist against the nation or locality? Or are you a localist against the nation? And I, I, I think my entire academic or intellectual life has been one of trying to resist seeing any of these as the ultimate choice. I think we are, we are creatures that can live in multiple in our, you know, in both our lives and in our minds can live with a multiple kind of layered sent, sense of membership and belonging. Absolutely. And um, I would just say for the viewers that um, full disclosure, I'm sort of affiliated with the National Conservatism Movement. So, you know, I'm, I'm, even if I don't necessarily fully agree with what Patrick Denise just said, I, the depth that he brings to these subjects means that even in disagreement, there's so much to think about that I, I can't help but engage with it. So I just say, you know, th thank you for your investment in this subject that even if I'm not fully on board with it, it doesn't matter because I'm, it makes me think about things in a much deeper way. So thank you for that. Um, so we'll just move to the last question and I'll let you go because uh, we've kept you long enough. Um, so we'll take a bit of a, um, go a bit of a different direction now. So I, I mentioned um, Leo Strauss at the start. So um, he was a thinker who's been quite influential in the American conservative movement over the last few decades. Um, and you had a debate with Michael Anton for ISI last year was it earlier this year, um, a few months ago anyway, and you and he were talking about how 
where you agreed and disagreed with Strauss's views. So I was wondering what you what your views on Strauss as a philosopher were and what your reservations about him were. Because I remember you saying that he um his treatment of Edmund Burke and natural rights and history wasn't exactly um fair, maybe might be a good word. Mm -hmm. Um so yeah, if we, if we could just talk about yeah. Strauss for a bit, because um sure. yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, I, it's uh, it's extremely interesting subject because um, Strauss's, let's say Strauss's analysis or the way that Strauss's analysis um, fell on American ears um, in the middle part of the 20th century and the latter part of the 20th century mm -hmm. gave a particular valence to American conservatism that I think we've been talking about, which is yeah. that um, this, this highly... Um, so, first, yeah, 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 yeah. So it's yeah. very, yeah, exactly. It has yeah. this uh, universalist cast. Uh, it has, it's obviously becomes closely linked and aligned with a, with an idea of classical liberalism, uh, which is odd given that Strauss himself viewed the moderns as a, yeah, as, as, a as, as a, as a, as a kind of decline or deficient or a secondary, yeah. a, a less, you know, a, a, a deficient form of political philosophy. But many people read Strauss as essentially saying that the ancient tradition gave us a kind of ideal vision of politics and the modern understanding was really kind of ground in the world of reality. Uh, and what the modern tradition understood was that the ideal vision of politics was ultimately unachievable. So that, so that rather than seeing in the classical tradition some genuine lessons that we could take about politics, which is how I read the classical mm. tradition, Mm. Many of the students of Strauss looked at the classical tradition as laying out the kind of outer boundaries of the possible and yeah. pointing us to modern thinkers like Machiavelli yeah. or Locke or Hobbes as the thinkers who actually give us the kind of practical how to guide of how to arrange politics, the kind of what Strauss himself described as the low but solid ground of self interest. Yeah. Right. Uh, so that in the first case, um, there was a particular way of reading Strauss that I don't think was inevitable, but I think in the context of the Cold War, when you were combating with this, yeah. you know, very utopian, you know, uh, totalitarian, uh, enemy. totalitarian enemy, the, the way in which Strauss was read was read through the lens of a particular historical set of demands uh, and uh, in a particular moment. Uh, that really does deserve a reassessment now, it seems to me. Yeah. And the second thing was that Strauss, um, and this is where I'll be more directly critical of Strauss, Strauss was dismissive not only of historicism in its progressive form. Yeah. So we could, we could count in that he's very critical of Rousseau and Hegel yeah. and Marx. Yeah. He was also critical of historicism in its traditionalist or conservative yes. form. Yeah. And in fact, in the chapter on historicism, in his landmark book, his great book, uh, Natural Right and History, which he's contrasting these two yeah. modes of, of thinking about the world, one of which emphasizes natural right, the unchanging rights of human beings according to nature, and history, uh, which is varied. It, uh, it, it gives us altered conditions, it changes over time. Relativism. Right. That yeah. um, Strauss classifies in that chapter after classifies Rousseau and Edmund Burke as essentially two fundamentally similar historicist thinkers. So it's a simultaneously a condemnation or a critique of progressive historicism and yeah. traditionalist historicism. And I think that tells us and it, and it points to why in America, the traditionalist strand of, um, of thinking or the traditionalist form of conservatism has had relatively little purchase in the conservative movement because so many of its intellectual architects were students of Strauss. And why someone like Russell Kirk, who you know, admittedly was looking very much to the British tradition and Edmund Burke perhaps especially uh, for guidance, Edmund Burke was kind of sidelined uh, and kind of thrust to the, thrust to the margins um, as the conservative movement was being built in the middle part of the 20th century. So even though Russell Kirk's name is invoked often as a kind of architect of modern American or Anglo-American conservatism, he's much more mentioned than he is read or taken seriously yeah. uh, by people. So, that. Yeah, and that was partly what lied behind the, the two pieces that I wrote recently uh, that was trying to revive uh, some serious consideration of some of Russell Kirk's arguments uh, in yeah. the book you mentioned, uh, The Roots of American Order.
Yeah, and that's on, on the post-liberal order substack, which people should go and look up and read because they're both great pieces and people should Thank subscribe you. to it because it's a great substack. So, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Appreciate it. Okay, well, um, that's all that I have. Um, that's all the questions I have. So thank you for taking the time to speak. Yeah, thank thanks. You. Thanks so much was, for, uh, was worth, for participating uh, in this. Yeah. It was worth waiting for. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank <laughs> you. I'm glad. And it was absolutely the same for me as well. So thank you. Yeah.